Welcome to Bigger Than the Game with Deremy and Jose. I'm Deremy Dove, and I'm joined by the man, the myth, the legend, my tag team partner, Mr. Jose Ruiz. What's going on, man? Deremy, how you doing, man? Good to be here, as always. It is, it is, man. It's always great doing this with you. And um, this one, I, I'll speak only for me, it, it, but I'm sure you too. It's a special one because anyone who knows me personally, you know, have heard me talk about how influential the late great Steve Sable was and honestly in doing this podcast, like yeah. um, I don't know if I'd be doing it without his influence. So it's a, it's a true pleasure to have on a supervising producer from NFL films, Mr. Paul Camerata. Paul, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks fellas. It's great to be here. Uh, good to see you guys. Hope all's going well. No, it is. It is. Yeah. And Paul, I guess I, uh, cause you know, this past Sunday was 10 years since the passing of Steve Sable and, you know, his time, you know, over 50 years, you know, running and pretty much doing anything from hosting, directing, producing at NFL films. So I was wondering as, just as a fan, when was the first time Steve Sable kind of came into your orbit? <laughs> so I remember very clearly I had, um, he came into it without me knowing it was him, um, which I think I've heard. And I've heard that story, similar versions of it since, since uh, as I've gotten older and since I've worked here. But I had an old VHS cassette tape called Super Sunday, and it was the history of the Super Bowls. And at the time, it was Super Bowl one through 21, Redskins Broncos, because it came out. That was just the year it came out. That was the most updated yeah. one. And it was probably, a I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour film. And so there were 21 games in there. And so each one was a couple minutes, but it was the classic, all the classic NFL films elements, the big narration, the, uh, the music that we all know so well that, that, um, that, that makes our ears perk up and the hair on the back of our neck stand up and all the big famous slow motion, a lot of slow motion images of the first 21 Super Bowls. And I just remember watching it over and over again. It was one of those sort of happy accidents. A friend of mine, I don't know, he got, he, he got, he came into two or three. I remember very clearly he came into two or three of these. It was like, Hey, you want this? And just handed me one one day and just started watching it and really, really never stopped. And that was sort of how NFL films, the, the, um, the style first came into my, to my, uh, world. And then as I got older, just through watching more TV, SPN, right. Watching the shows, like at the time it was, this is the NFL, and uh, yeah. NFL Films Presents, where Steve would do the, the stand-ups, right, the studio wraps between segments. So you get to see and hear him. And it was the same thing. It was like I, I saw his face, and it, you don't always read it. You know, you're a little kid. I don't even remember reading his name on the screen, but it's like oh, like I knew his face. He was a familiar face right. um, in those style of shows. So that was um, – that's a very clear memory of, of him sort of just being there, uh, talking football. No, that, that's that's a great one. I know for me, I remember as a kid, like the probably the first ones I remember were the bloopers, you know, and I was like, I used to love that. Like they used to make me, I, I would crack up watching those. Um, but you talked about like, you know, Steve Sable a little bit there. And what would you say or what do you think is, is his best trait as a filmmaker? Huh. I think the things that I admire in, in his work and in, I mean, working side by side with him and, and having the privilege of having him critique my work is just, he's just, was I in my observation, he was endlessly curious about football. I mean, passionate about it, of course, um, engaged in it, but just curious about every aspect of it. You mentioned bloopers. So he was, he thought the, the humorous parts of the game were funny. He thought the emotional, dramatic parts of the game were interesting. Um, the characters uh, that made the game so interesting, whether it was players, coaches, peripheral people who made the game go. I think Steve, I never saw him not be interested in elements of the game that whether it was just, just little things, you know, the kickoff, you know, kickoff, or the, the uprights, the weather, all the things that surrounded the game. Like he never seemed to be bored um, with things that that were familiar to everybody else, he found new ways to look at them, to capture them, to present them, um, and I think that came through in the films that he made, and that especially he inspired. And I think this is what leadership is, right? He inspired other people 
to make films um, because there was so much work that was done over all those decades. There are a lot of other folks behind him, but I think it was his energy and passion and curiosity for the game that it that moved people to uh, to demonstrate those same traits and find layers of the game that that viewers maybe wouldn't have found on their own. No, that's true. And that's something that I guess I kind of like we said, you said earlier, it was in your orbit when you didn't know it. That was something that as a younger fan was in my orbit, but I didn't know it and truly appreciate till I got older was that endless curiosity he had really helped to fuel that passion. And that passion came out in whether it was like Jose said, the NFL films present shows or those big epic, you know, super Sundays or NFL, you know, top 100 players of all time, that curiosity and always wanting to learn kind of like fueled that passion. And I try to take that, whether it's doing this podcast or just being a friend or a, a family member, trying to always, always being curious and always trying to show that passion for, you know, that person or that subject that I'm working on. Yeah. Now you could tell the passion, like, and I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned that word, Paul, because it, it's, you can see the passion coming out in all these, you know, these films or, or anything to do, even if it's like a, you know, a 2015 year review of like the Indianapolis Colts. Like it was just like, it, it is a lot of passion in there. And again, like you talked about those shots of like, you know, the uprights and the wind, like whatever the case may be. Like one of my favorite ones, is like, you know, like the, the line of scrimmage, right? Like that one shot where you guys get, and it's just like directly through. And it's like, I've never, I don't remember ever seeing that anywhere else. And it was just so powerful, man. Like it, it just puts you right in that mix. And I think that's, you talk about that passion. I think it's that passion that Steve had for all of those little nuances of the game, which were, which were amazing. Yeah. I think it's the same as the players that he admired so much, right? If you're a player at any level, there's a lot of, a lot of little stuff that ha goes into being a player. There's a lot of right. stretch, boring, you know, people would say boring things like stretching, preparing, icing after a game, you know, not sexy things that it takes to play football. And I think the folks that do it great find excitement and, and get energy from those moments that other people would, would find boring or not interesting. And that's, that's the expression of that passion to me. And I think, that's what Steve had, like just like a player had to approach every rep in every practice in every day of every season from August to February with that same consistent energy. I think he brought that into how he looked at the game and just, you know, it's not enough to just shoot the slow motion ball in the air, like from the corner of the end zone. Yeah, that's great. We need that. But where else can we put a camera? Let's put a camera up at the top of a dome stadium so we can look down and see like an image from, from, uh, uh, from a bird's eye view, right? Let's put, let's put a microphone, as we know, on a coach pacing the sideline. Let's hear what's going on over there. Let's try and get a camera in a locker room or even just outside a locker room in a tunnel to see the look, like that backstage look on a player's face before they actually have to run out in front of the public and, and play their game. Like, I think he, he, he found – it's like finding fruit in everywhere, in every corner of the stadium, right? He never, he never saw a spot in the stadium, the parking lot, right? I could go, I could go on and on. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's where the stories were. That's where he found stories and taught us to, find, to look for stories, um, which I think is what keeps the work going, you know, year over year. Yeah, like even some of those like boring parts you were talking about and like some of the best quotes that I remember is like pregame warm-ups when y'all, when NFL Films goes up to guys and, you know, they're warming up and they're giving you like some great content. Like that's, you're exactly right. Like, cause again, like as a nerd fan, like I am, and you know, I, I'll say we're on a podcast talking about NFL films and Steve Sable. I can agree. I, I think we're all in the same boat. Like I love all that stuff, you know, and I, the more I can get them, the happier I'm going to be for sure. <laughs> that's great. Now is that where also, cause I remember seeing, cause I, Jose said nerd fans of Steve Sable NFL films. And you said like finding that parking lot, like getting those little like odd like things that people would usually overlook is that where he kind of invented like that quote unquote mole position as a cameraman like where he kind of would get those things like is you know what I'm talking about like I think I, it's I, called the mole position yeah there there are all kinds with there's a mole there was a weasel I think it was all <laughs> about and, and it really became inventing the language at least internally at the beginning so that so that folks could talk about where they were going to be and what the responsibility was just like any any organization, the more niche you have and the, the more your crew grows, you need to give everybody like, what's your job, right? And so they would come up with languages and, and how they would how they would attack the game and how they would 
think about the game and then staff where people were going to be. I think it was all about details. And Steve had a real artist's eye for things, whether it was, again, the way something looked, the way it sounded, trying to create feeling, sensation in people. And when they watch the films and his artist training, and, and I think you guys might know this, I don't know if everybody does. He was he was trained and studied um, collage art, you know, the art of taking little scraps of paper, literally like scrapbook mm -hmm. pieces, but then rearranging it in such a way that it created a new something new. Right. So if you think about cutting out scraps of paper and gluing them to a piece of of, you know, just a regular piece of paper, that's how he approached filmmaking and capturing football. Where where are these little details that might not initially feel like they have anything to do with each other? but each one on their own is interesting. Let me just keep getting them, right? Let me go to a game on Sunday and just keep finding, again, a shot of a ball on a tee, a shot of water dripping off a goalpost, a shot of a coach's face furrowed, you know, during a, a pivotal play or a shot of a flag in, in during the national anthem. Let me just keep grabbing them. And then let me bring them back with a little time and, and reevaluate them and, and zoom out and go, you know, what do I see here? What, what's the bigger picture that I can reassemble? Um, from all these little details. And I think that's where, again, literally from, from driving up to the stadium to driving out at the end, there was always something to, to mine and then to uh, use as raw materials to, to create a, and to tell a story, right? That's what it comes down to. What is the story of, of a game, of a player, um, of, of a stadium? Um, who are the characters and what is their story uh, that we want to tell? So I have a, a twofold question for you because – I'm just curious being that you were a fan in your youth, just like we were. So I kind of just want to know what it would feel like, like that first time you meet Steve Sable and he's, you're now working for him. And also that first time when he's like looking over your shoulder over a piece of, you know, a, a piece that you're working on and it's being like, he's saying thumbs up or thumbs down or fix this or fix that. What were those feelings like? I think, in all the best ways, they were – I'm trying to use the right word because I know what I want to say, <laughs> but I want it to come across right. Like in all the best ways, it wasn't dramatic because because of his disposition. He was so disarming. He was so uh, engaging. He was so interested in the work and the people doing it. It wasn't like you had to be on eggshells and worried about – because the guys were just – he would just have the conversation with any of us about what the work was or what we were working on or – what we're interested in or give us feedback about an assignment we've been given from someone else that maybe wasn't our own idea, but we were very, you know, very steeped in it at the time. So I just remember feeling very almost seamless. Like he was just another guy in the room that was, that was in all the best ways being authentic and down to earth with, with connecting through the work and being interested in what we were doing. It wasn't like there's a the guy on TV, what's this going to be like? And then it was this big, like scary moment. He was just kind of a regular guy in, 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 in all the best ways, if that makes sense. No, it does. And that's awesome. That's kind of what you would hope as right. you know, but yeah. it's cool to like, it's cool to hear that, that he was, because I know for me, if I was in like your shoes or someone else growing up watching him, it would have been intimidating just being like, man, that's Steve, that's Steve Sable. That's the guy I see yeah. on TV all the time. And, right. and then it's like, this guy is the reason why we're doing all this. He, and you know, did the bloopers. He did all these different, you know, working with Sam Spence on the music. And now he's looking at my, what I'm doing. And it's like, uh Oh, so like, that's really awesome to hear that. He kind of put the people working for him at ease. That's great leadership. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And I also think that that came across in, in, in his interviews, you talk, you, you were used the word disarming. And I, I think that's a great way to put it. Cause for me, he was one of the best interviewers I, I can remember seeing on, on TV. And it's like from anyone, from any player, coaches, like I just felt like he the way it came across, as an, it, it was more like less of an interview and more of like just a natural flowing conversation. Uh, that was like one of my favorite parts of like a lot of this NFL films work and Steve Sable's work was his interviewing. I, I You know, I remember him interviewing Parcells and Parcells' house and it was just like, it, it was just like a, they were going back and forth, kind of like busting each other's balls a little bit. And, you know, like it, it was just really cool to see. And again, you don't really see Bill Parcells in that light a lot, right, as a fan, because you see him as this like tough, like in press conferences, doing what he does in press conferences. But I just felt like someone like Steve Sable can can bring that out of a lot of people. And he definitely did it. And I think disarming is, is a great way to put it. 
And that's a great example. So, so St- it's be- because that example you told is emblematic of his his track record of all these films, right? That doesn't happen by accident. It's a function of his relationships that he, again, right. by engaging with people, by maintaining those relationships, by demonstrating an authenticity and a love for the game that helps him connect with people. When Steve was a running back at Colorado College, Bill Parcells was a young coach who coached against him. So here they met. 50, 60 years ago as, as, you know, 18, 20 year olds or whatever it was. And then as their lives went on separately, they kept interacting with each other, but that relationship continued to, to flourish. And I think, I think the, I think just judging by the access Parcells gave Steve and gave us over the years, it illustrates that he trusted him and he respected the work that he did. And he knew that he was all about the game and celebrating the game and celebrating the people who who laid it on the line every week and every day to to because they love the game and because they love bringing it to other people. So I think Parcel's relationship and the longevity of it illustrates what so many of Steve's relationships with, with folks were and how they were able to um, help us do the work that we did. And and again, be an example for us to take that same tack with 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 people now um, as we meet players and, and coaches and as we go on and do our work. And and really, it's about finding and developing those relationships to tell those stories, because you can't just cold call, right, knock on someone's door and feel like they're going to let you in and, and give you um, give you their story. I think it's a matter of of showing them what you're about and then um, showing them just just to showing showing them that again, that passion. Uh, for right. for 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 the game and and using that as something to connect through. Yeah, so you, you kind of touched on my next question a little bit, Paul. So um, I, I appreciate the segue. Um, <laughs> y- you mentioned like some of the stuff, some of the ways Steve still kind of influencing you professionally. Like you know, can you add a little more to that? Even if it's personally, like professionally, what are ways, some ways that Steve Sable still kind of, you know, helps you along the way? Yeah, I think the I think there's a couple things he he put in place. You know whether he was doing all of them consciously or or just it evolved along the way. And again, he you got to remember he he part of what he did so well was build these teams of people who were all talented unto themselves. Whether it was as a writer or a uh, an audio engineer, uh, a film, a cinematographer, really great at each one of their crafts. And so each one of them brought something to the table. And then the collective made you know a rising tide lifts all boats kind of deal. Like he Steve put that together and and it it created work that had that still has legs. Um, I think that was something he did that has, that still influences us because we have to do it every day, whether it's three people on a little social media project or, uh, 20 people on this massive documentary, uh, crew that we need to put together over or a series that's going to last 12 months and we're going to shoot 10 episodes of it. I think the teamwork is, is an important thing that, that he, uh, fostered and influences us. I think there's individual work that he created and I'll give you a couple examples, <clears throat> Steve, did a did a film a short film in the late 60s he it was called joe and the magic bean and it was it was the uh a almost a children's storybook voice perspective written as a fairy tale of joe namath winning super bowl three and in the story joe namath is this uh with this almost childlike wonder the voice tells the story of of this boy joe and his magic bean the football and how he conquers the, his evil enemies, who are, you know were the Baltimore Colts, the big bad Baltimore Colts. And it was it was voiced by I believe don't quote me, but I believe it was the uh, the voice of the old Winnie the Pooh character from from back in the day. So it had this very childlike look and feel and the music to it. Well, just this year it just aired. We did a reboot of Joe and the Magic Bean with Joe Burrow as the central figure, and it was all about how he was this heroic figure that came to Cincinnati and, and helped save the Bengals and, and got to the Super Bowl and fell short, but he's going to, you know, keep, keep fighting the fight to get there. And didn't uh, the producers make the decision to have Joe Namath voice the Joe Burrow piece. Right. And he, and at the, at the beginning of it, Joe Namath tells the story of there was this thing done on me back way back then. And so today we're going to redo it with about Joe Burrow. So that, that little seed that Steve planted years ago, that again, way back when, before folks were maybe taking that sort of filmmaking tack to pro football, Steve pushed the envelope in a new direction because of, again, his curiosity and his just his imagination, celebrated Joe Namath. And that piece and that character and that voice of Joe Namath still is is uh, blossoming into something new 
literally 50, 55, whatever it is years later. Um, so I think there's, there's concrete examples of individual work he did. And then there's just the sort of spirit he created again in terms of creativity, imagination, curiosity, teamwork that we still operate with on a daily basis that helps us keep finding new ways to tell the story of pro football. I'm, I'm grinning because you're taking me back because so many times on ESPN Classic or on, even on ESPN2, when they had like a little bit of time in between like their next show and the previous show ended, they would play that Joe and the yeah. Beanstalk clip from way back in the day. And I would hear it every day. And I kind of I'm I used to get like annoyed by it because I'm like, man, they always play this every day. But then a few weeks ago when I saw the Joe Burrow updated version, it kind of gave me like a warm feeling because it took me <laughs> back to always hearing it. So I, that's a great example I because that was that was like such like you wouldn't think to do that because especially I mean, even now, but in the 60s, like NFL, it's just hardcore, tough but then to shows, use that. Man. Yeah. You know, and then to use that like that, like you said, like a children's fairy tale. But to describe this unbelievable story was so creative. Yeah, you got to. You, I think the thing for folks to remember is because it feels, it feels like the norm now to approach, you know, content or sports or certain topics with that broad brush. Back then, like you said, it wasn't as common. But for Steve, it made perfect sense because he was always one of the things he was always at his core. In addition to being a lover of football, was a lover of movies. So he always had that perspective of a filmmaker that found again humor drama, um, uh, f all the emotions, fear, mystery, suspense, tension, all the things that he saw and experienced through the films, whatever the topics were, whether they were war movies or romance movies or whatever, styles of films, but styles of stories. He just took those tools and just turned them in a different direction towards the sport of football. So he, it, it made sense to him to turn something into a fairy tale or a love story or whatever the case may be. Because to him, it was just another type of movie. You know, football was the universe, but the lens was the same as any filmmaker in Hollywood or anywhere would be using to tell the story of their characters. No, I, uh, so I, it was tough for me as a fan and someone who loves Steve, but I kind of wanted to know that, you know, I'm sure it was bittersweet that, you know, in 2020, he was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So I kind of wanted to know what it was like for you and a lot of your coworkers who worked and love Steve and, you know, to kind of see him get that recognition, you know, his dad went in 2011, I believe. So uh, that he finally was able to, to get inducted into the hall of fame and rightfully so, but it was also, I know it had to be tough for you guys that he wasn't here, you know, with us. Sure. I think, yeah, I mean, everybody has missed him. Um, you know, throughout the last 10 years. And I think, but that moment was great because it was a celebration of, of him and the work that he did. And I think the celebration of his story, right? I mean, so much of his work was telling other people's stories and, and that was always what his, what his MO was. But for people, it helped people learn his individual story, all these things we're talking about now and sort of understand why the work he did made such great sense to him and, and why it energized him and why it, it helped spread pro football so easily. To him, it just made sense. And I think, the Hall of Fame moment helped pull back the curtain on his life and his approach for a lot of people. Um, and it continued to, to push us to tell his story. We did a, we started a biography series last year called NFL Icons. It airs on Epics. And in mm -hmm. the, in the premiere season, one of the first eight episodes was on Steve. So it gave us an opportunity of uh, his Hall of Fame and Charming gave us an opportunity and, and uh, to go back and, and retell his story in a new way through this series uh, re-examine a lot of the footage we had of him, a lot of the old interviews. And um, what's neat about that series is it's really driven by letting the central figure tell their story in their own words. And so while most of the episodes were folks who are still alive, Steve, um, we did Stephen Lombardi, just to, just to give you a little context on, on yeah. his stature in the game. Those were the two posthumous folks that we did. And we went back and just re-listening to his interviews, um, hearing things he said years ago and throughout the years. And getting the new content, you know, as time has passed, everything's in a new context, but so much of it is still so relevant and still so inspiring. So uh, that was a great uh, uh, chance for us to celebrate him. And again, tell that story because, again, another thing you have to remember is they started in the early 60s, he and, he and his father, Ed, um, 
with films. So there, there are people who grew up with it and then they're, they're their kids who grew up with it. Well, now their kids are growing up with it. So, so even though there's some things that are familiar to us um, and things we still learn about him, some of the most basic things, there are kids now who are just learning about him for the first time. So it's an opportunity to, to continue to, to, uh, to extend that legacy and to let, uh, let other people see what he's all about and what he did. And again, hopefully inspire them to, to, uh, to follow their passion. I think, again, that's one of the core things that, that his, we could take away from his story. No, I, and that's a, that's a great, great way to put it. And, um, so Paul, I know you mentioned earlier, one of your favorite, like kind of what kind of got you, you know, hooked on to like NFL films and things like that. We talked about Steve's hall of fame career, obviously. And so what would you say in your opinion, obviously is, you know, one of the, you know, one of the proudest pieces that, that Steve Sable, you know, produced, whatever the case may be, or he talked about, like, you know, personally with some of y'all, like, what, what would you say, in your opinion, was one of those? I mean, I don't want to speak for him, for sure. I think, but I think I'll go back to something you, you mentioned. And I think it's, uh, I think the Follies was always a very significant, just uh, style, if you will, if not one particular Follies film, but, but kind of, all of them, because I think it's that idea of laughter. Um, Steve's got a little index card on his desk. So his desk is still the way it was uh, when he died. Um, and there was an index card he kept on his desk on like a little stand. And it says in his handwriting, did you make someone laugh today? And I think humor and laughter was such an important part of just his soul and his being. And and, and I think bringing that to pro football um was I think because again it was it's 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 pro sports it's a very serious business but he found the lighter side of it and he shared that lighter side with other people so I think back then when they first did it and then it continued to find ways to to find laughter whether it was through a Brett Favre uh, wire uh, or anything continue you know modern follies um, making people laugh through football I think was always if you just again measure what the work did and where he put his energy. I think it's safe to say that was something that was that was important to him. Yeah, yeah that makes absolutely. sense. It makes sense to me because he seemed like a pretty f- funny dude, like on camera. Like he seemed like you know he got along with a lot of people and he can make a lot of people laugh. So that's and in my life, I'll tell you that's super important for me too. Like yeah. I, I I I really feel like laughter is like we need it. We need it, and you know life can get really serious sometimes and. I agree. I, I like that quote because sometimes we just got to sit back and even laugh at ourselves if we have to. But Jeremy, I know I cut you off. Go ahead. Man. No, no, absolutely. No, no, I, I agree. And I think that's the thing that showed it with Steve is he took football seriously. He took that that piece or that person he was talking to or interviewing seriously and showed them respect. But he didn't take himself too seriously, which is, you know, a lot of times people don't think about it and we can get lost in that. Sometimes it's like, Hey, maybe we are, we got to lighten up. Like, you know, like we can, we can laugh at certain things. We can laugh at it ourselves at times. We don't have to always be so serious. And I think that's one of the many things that I try to take from Steve was like, yeah, you take what you're doing seriously, but don't take yourself that seriously. So yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I, um, I kind of have something a little bit for me. And it's a question for both you guys, honestly, um, so, Paul, I know you're the producer, but I guess asking to put that fan hat on hmm. and it's hard to say just one. But if there's a couple of like whether it's a shot uh, or a soundbite, like what's your like, I think it's hard to say one, but like favorite NFL film pieces that you guys like love that. Like if you're saying like NFL films, these are some of the first ones that pop into your mind. Like and it could be anything, but like what's that for you guys? Go ahead, Jose. Oh man! All right, cool. I normally let the guests go first, but I'll give you a little bit of time to think. Um, <laughs> I, I know that move. Um, no, but seriously, like one of, one of my favorites was um, 49ers were playing the Eagles. Obviously, you know one of my favorite teams, and um, you know it was a it was a pass. I can't remember the year. I want to say it's '89 when I think Montana threw like four touchdown passes in the fourth yeah. quarter to beat the Eagles. But he threw one bomb to Jerry Rice and like it was just the way the camera followed that throw and you don't even see Rice until the ball is coming down and he just runs right under it for a beautiful touchdown pass right over the middle I don't know how far the pass it was a long touchdown pass but it was just a such a beautiful shot and and this is way before like cameras on you know going across the stadium and things like that it was just it 
one of my favorite, absolute favorite shots that NFL films has ever done. Um, that's my number one probably go to. It's just that it was just so beautiful. It was like the throw was a perfect spiral for Montana. And it's just like Montana to Rice and that iconic duo. And, and again, it did hurt that it was against the Eagles, but it's just it it just brought like the beauty of of like throwing the football and things like that for me. So that will be my probably first one I can think about. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, I think about, I know we talked about him already, but it's true. And it's because I grew up a giant fan. Uh, I think about all the Bill Parcells sound. Uh, I think it's, I think hearing that and seeing, you know, here's a guy that I had an image of and they were, you know, when I was growing up, they were good. And so they were on a lot and they were in the Madden summer all game. And there were a lot of images of him and, and you'd see him coaching on the broadcast, but then to get to the point where you're hearing what he was saying uh, and how he dealt with his players. And sometimes the sound told you a lot more, like the images gave you one, one sense of what the guy was, but then you heard how he talked to his players and there was the whole gamut of emotions and engagement. And the, the famous one that, that you hear a lot is he's on, over on the bench and he's leaned over with his players and he says, Hey, fellas, this is what you work all off season for. This is why you lift all them weights. This is why you do all that. And he swears. And that bite to me is, is I think about it all the time because it's, it's in my life. Like you think about why you're doing something. What is your motivation? You know, and then you get to the moment. Why, like, why, why do you have to prepare? Because when that moment comes and it's time to have done that preparation, you better have done it or it's too late to start doing it then. So it's, it's useful to me as like an, an inspirational thing. It's interesting to me as uh, a storyteller and a filmmaker to see that scene of all those giant guys, massive like humans huddled up together, trying to like do something together, seeing the passion on this face. And again, it's, it's not a moment where he's, he is loud, but he's not like coming down at them. He's, he's, he's like connecting with them on a human level. Like we're all in this together. It feels like this great inspiring foxhole moment. And he's reminding them of what they've already done. Like you guys have already done the work. Now you just got to go out there and, and put it all together on the field. So I think those Bill Parcells moments of watching him deal with his players, deal with the media, um, you know, how to, how to say a lot without using a lot of words sometimes, uh, all those things, you know, watching him, watching him uh, deal with Lawrence, you know, superstars like Lawrence Taylor and sometimes doing it with just a few terse words, but getting his message across it, but then screaming at somebody else, um, or like Phil Sims, like Phil doing Sims. film Sims stuff. Yeah, that was great. Belichick, all of them, right? With young Belichick. Uh, those those sound bites for all the reasons, for being a fan, for being a, um, trying to make movies and, and, and tell stories. I think those things all connect with me. And, and Paul, real quick, we're, I'm a diehard Eagles fan. Jeremy's a diehard Eagles fan. But we are two huge fans of Bill Parcells. Like we, we, you know, we've done a bunch of stuff on Parcells and those giants and, and Belichick and all that. So no, I'm, I'm right there with you. Even like one of my favorite quotes was um, the football life on Reggie and Jerome where, where, you know, Phil Sims is like, yeah, Parcells calls me. And it's like, are you ready? Cause the Eagles about to draft Jerome Brown and your life's about to change. And I was like, man, like that was such great insight on like such a big deal, such a huge move, such a huge draft pick. And, just that quote, man, was 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 awesome for me. But yeah, we're richy with that parcel stuff. It, it's always great stuff. Yeah, that that stuff lasts forever. I love it. Yeah, Jeremy, how about you, man? I know you're such a huge fan of NFL films. You you got to jump yeah. in. Yeah, um, it's hard. I there's I'm gonna I can't just do one. I got a tie a tie for first for me. <laughs> so I'll piggyback Paul a little bit. Where uh, there's always the the Super Bowl highlight films and you know every year that weekend of the super bowl somebody's nfl network they're playing them all the time like right. from one to you know current day but i go back to super bowl 25 and that last drive and the end and the music that's playing when scott norwood's coming onto the field and they have like the bills like announcers like talking and just like that the music like just like the whole crescendo like gets louder and then you just see it go wide right and to me that you know, ABC, Y World of Sports had the thrill, victory, agony, defeat. And I think about that piece from NFL Films right there, like surely like defines like why we love this game and why you can be such on a high when you win. And it is so crushing when you lose. And I think that was some of just I don't think I think this I, I hard to use the word perfect, but that's just near perfect to me. Like 
I couldn't think of any better music or any better like shots. And you're getting the Bills sideline and them all holding hands. And you see Parcells and Belichick and the players just standing there watching. And to me, that was perfect. And the other one for me is something that I didn't realize till later that I thought this interview was on TV, but honestly, without NFL films, we wouldn't have the footage is after, I guess that Super Bowl 23, that Niners Bengals, Bill Walsh's last game, he gets his third Super Bowl and Brent Musburger's interviewing him in the locker room. And he asks, is this the final game for Bill Walsh? And Bill Walsh starts crying and he starts crying on his son's shoulder. And that right there sums up like, the feeling of how much he loved this game, but also that feeling of burnout that he had. And he gave all he had and he really couldn't give any more. And I think it showed what this game and how much, you know, fans love it and these players and coaches and scouts all love it. But what it does to you, where it gives you that high, but it takes so much out of you, especially to be great. So those are my two favorite for those reasons. That one's great. What, what I think about, just to pull back the curtain a bit just and connect to some other things we were talking about, so that was shot by a guy named Hank McKelway. Hank McKelway worked – he was a cinematographer here for, I mean, I think it was 45 years. Like, wow. I think it was like forever. And Hank shot – Hank started out as Steve's assistant. When Steve would shoot, he would be his camera assistant. And then he – as he grew up in the business, he shot himself. He ended up running the camera department ultimately before he left. But that, that's an example where because of the environment that Steve created, because of the continuity of the teams, because of the way he engaged everybody and what the story was and who the characters were, and because of the way he, it was, you know, that, that sort of idea of collaboration, it wasn't just he's the director and he's going to point and say, go shoot that. Hank followed that scene. If you were to watch the raw footage of that, he basically follows the scene and he knows that Wal- what's going on with Walsh and sort of keeps finding Walsh and finds that moment and captures it and he's being the director and the editor and the film and the cinematographer all at once. And, and because of sort of knowing that film's language knows that that's a big deal. And he's going to, he's going to stay on Bill Walsh until, until he has the moment and he captures the moment forever. Right. And it, and it feels like a movie scene that you would script out and spend a week to rehearse, but he's got one shot at it and, and he knows where to be and how to shoot it and how to frame it. And, you know, and the, the sound guy with him is, knows where to have the microphone. And so now we have Bill, Bill Walsh's life like a movie unfolding in real time because this guy and his instincts that were so sharpened by working with Steve and because of the environment that Steve created. So I think to me, it, it tells the story of Walsh, but, it, but when you zoom out again, you see a lot of other story there in, in terms yeah. of the, the team that has to be put together for something like that to, to live. And it was such a great shot, a great angle, right? Like I, I felt like I was there. Like I felt like I was standing right there just watching this. And that's what, and that's a great moment there. I mean, I felt like that was such a powerful moment for me to see it because it's just like, man, like you can feel like, I, I feel like I can just give him a hug. You know what I mean? Like it, it was just such yeah. a deep moment for me that it was, it was a great shot, a great, great shot. And, and that's fascinating just to, you know, cause I agree, Jose. And it's like, they at, they won the Super Bowl, and you can hear the no everyone. They're happy. Right. Everyone, you know, Eddie Bartolo, Ronnie, they're screaming, yelling. But it feels like, in a way, like no one else is in the locker room besides mm-hmm. like those three guys, and and obviously you know Hank is shooting. But it feels like it's like man, like no one else. Like some, I used to watch that and be like, did anyone else see see that? <laughs> like, did any of the players or coaches like see him doing that? Because it's they won the Super Bowl, so it's a crazy atmosphere. And it's like, no, that's true because you think about it, and I've seen it when, like, America's game for the 88 Niners or, like, the Missing Ring series for the 88 Bengals. And, you know, Sam Weish was the coach, and he had coached with Bill Walsh, and Bill Walsh coached him when he was a quarterback. So them, like, kind of, like, hugging after the game and Bill Walsh pretty much leaning on Sam Weish because he's so emotionally exhausted from that, you know, which was a great game and a great final drive, but – that's just awesome to hear that story from you, Paul, about Hank following him and having that instinct just to be like, let me just stay with him. Because if you watch, Bill Walsh wasn't like – he was very subdued. Yeah. So part of me, and that's why I'm not in the business, would be like, all right, he's kind of quiet. Maybe I'll go to, like, this player. like, But he stuck with it, and he gave this – I got this all-time shot. Yeah, and I think, I think what I love hearing your – 
you mentioned like four different places that that's been, and it's probably been in 400 different shows by this point. But I think we talked about earlier about what's the greatest of something. And that's sometimes a tough question to answer. Yeah. But I think if you, if you go, what are the things you think about it the other way? What are the things you keep coming back to and you never find them boring or you always find something new in them or you always like, to me, that right. demonstrates greatness, right? It's hard to say maybe that's great, but if over the years you still find a song interesting or inspiring or you keep wanting to watch a movie when you're flip, you can't flip past it. Like to me, that kind of says it's great in some way, whatever great means it's got some kind of greatness in it that it keeps, again, we go back to what we started with curiosity, engagement, what keeps pulling you in must be something there. That's pretty magical. That keeps, that keeps pulling you in. And I think there's so many of those things that Steve and, and the teams back in the day. And again, what, what they taught us to do in, in being curious, you, you, tend to, it increases your odds of capturing something that are going to, other people are going to be curious about and engage with. So I think that's finding, finding those moments as inspiration is, is, uh, is another great thing that we have. Yeah. But even understanding the moment, like understanding that, Hey, this might be, you know, Walsh's last season, like to use the same example and to un have the understanding of like the moment and everything that's going on all crazy. But let me just focus on Bill Walsh because I have a feeling something good might come from this, you know, and, and, and it worked out perfectly. So absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So uh, and I, Oh, go ahead, Jose. I would, I would, no, go ahead. I'll let you go. And then I, uh, I have one final thing, but go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think Paul, what you said about greatness. And I think that is like a great definition of greatness and a great definition of art. And, you know, Steve from starting with Steve and Ed and down to yourself and, all the great men and women who uh, who have and continue to work at NFL Films, you guys are great artists. Yeah. And when we look at a great, you know, from a great game in sports, but also like a great song, a great movie, and, you know, I have these conversations, you know, TV show, I have these conversations with my friends all the time, like, I remember where I first heard this song, or, man, did you think, like, why do you love this album? And, like, I love this song, and I love that song. Like, you know, I remember the other day, someone brought up, you know, Nirvana and Nevermind, and that's been out for 30 years. But then, like, I'm like, I love it. And people are like, oh, I never thought about that being a favorite song. And they give this song, and I'm like, I didn't think about that. Like, that's a good point. And I think you're right. Like, that is the definition of great art. And I think Steve was a great artist, and I think you guys are, like, what you're continuing to do. So, like, I, I never heard it broken down that way, but I'm glad you did. Oh, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, it's yeah the example. It's it's all about the example that 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 he created. So it's it's uh, it makes it fun and and in many ways it's it, you know it doesn't feel like work. Like the John Madden quote, you well, it's a lot of people. If you find the thing you love, then you don't you don't really work a day in your life. And I think I would say that Steve, that's one of those cliches, but it has truth to it. But in my life, seeing Steve, that's as clear a demonstration with my own eyes as I've ever seen of that cliche. Like you know, walking the earth is. Is somebody yeah. who somebody who doesn't go to work and think of it with that word work. Uh, I, I can I can say that for sure. I I saw that in him in in how he how he lived. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then I guess my last thing was you know, Jeremy kind of touched on it a little bit, like the artistry of NFL films and and how much it's influenced both of us. And and thank you for all of that, right? Like thank you for all the work you you all put into that. And I, I feel like, and I know I'm not the only person saying this, and I know I've heard this said before, it's like the NFL is where it's at in regards to all four major sports because of NFL films, right? Like the work that you all have done. Because you think about it, me and Jeremy talk about this all the time, right? Like if you look at each sport, it has rich history, right? Baseball definitely does. Basketball does. Hockey does, you know. But it's all that history is not captured the way football is captured, right? The football history is captured, and we can follow through all that history from Super Bowl one, right, to today's game. And and again, I, I think, you know, my hat's off to NFL films because again, like I don't think football is such a powerhouse. It's a great sport, obviously, and it's it'll be a top sport always, but I think the work that NFL films has done to put it there is is second to none, right? Because again, if you if if you know we talk about a lot of comparison me and Jeremy uses like the NBA, right? Like so much rich, great history we never seen it, right? Wilt's 100-point game. I'm going to use Jeremy's example we always talk about. 
no footage of it, right? Like if that was a football game, like we would have footage of it. You know what I mean? NFL films would have that and we would they would have a documentary on it or whatever the case may be. So again, I guess it's more of a thank you, but it, it's just <laughs> to Jeremy's point, like, you know, like NFL films is it's man, like what the work they've done there, it, it's definitely propelled football to where it is today. No, I appreciate that. And, and it's, it, look, again, we stand on the shoulders of that greatness every day. And I mentioned right. that, I mentioned that icon series, but it's, it, there's a great, that's a great example. So that whole series is it's, it's hall of famers. It's familiar names. It's not, it's not finding people you've never heard of, but because St there are, there are people in that series that Steve and teams interviewed, you know, er almost every year or every three years from the time they were 22 and entered the league to the time, you know, Walt, we just, the Walter Payton show just aired. We have seven or eight hours and hours, uh, hour long Walter Payton interviews. You see him age on screen. And of course, in his case, you see him get ill. And, and of course he dies very young, but we're, we have the opportunity to make these films today that we've, or produce them, you know, in, let's say in this year, 2022, those films have been in production for 40 years. Right. Those, they, they've been being shot for 40 years. It's like following, following people their whole lives. And then we, we say, well, how can we, how can we harness that? You know, sometimes you do, you interview Jose or Jeremy for three hours and you make a film just with that interview. And that, that's a way to do it. And it might capture everything about you in this moment. But if I, if I were to have interviews of you from the time you were 15 years old until now, and then I, I, I pull things out of each one of them and put them back together I'm going to get a whole different portrait of you. And, and again, your evolution and where you came from and what you're all about. So we have this chance because of all that Steve did in continuing to follow the game. And it, it helps, it helps again, inspire us to, to find new ways. And, and as time, time years go on, things take on new meaning. So it's, it always helps us uh, find new stories and then reshare old stories uh, for a new time. No, wow. absolutely. It's great. Yeah. You guys, yeah, it's amazing. And, I guess real quick for me before we wrap it up, but is the ha, a have you listened or heard it, and b is it as epic as people make it? Where that I guess those clips of John Facenda cursing on his like mess ups, <laughs> like I've heard so many people talk about that in in interviews about NFL films and stuff. So I'm wondering, is that a myth? Is that true? Like like those. Well, I think what I would say about John Facenda is anything, any word that came out of his his mouth was was good and interesting. Whether it was, uh, it's like when Vin Scully passed uh, this year, and and folks were they played that clip of him reading a grocery list that someone recorded all those years back. Yeah. When you when you have a voice like John Facenda, anything that's recorded uh, is is interesting or inspiring yeah. or funny. So uh, that's voice of God is is a is as good and as as appropriate a nickname as I think I can think of. Yeah, I mean, okay. e even the Lombardi episode is Lombardi. I'm right. like, oh my god, this is like so amazing, man. Oh man, I, I, yeah, because I even think of like when Ed got into the Hall of Fame, and the, you know that I'm like, how do you present like in the future these like, Hall of Famers? How do you like follow that? Well, it was like, Ed say I got one film, and then it just and it's I look, I see it on YouTube, all it's like six minutes of just like pure greatness and i'm just like man that's setting the mold for like hall of fame videos like from here on out like how do you follow that like which we know you can't because that's yeah. what made them them brilliant but it's just like geez even even ed in his early 90s i got one film and it's still like it's just a masterpiece so oh man but you're right that is the voice of god for sure john facenda but paul this was a. Uh, this was amazing, honestly, yeah, and it's just he's someone I think about all the time. And I, you know, Jose and I talk about NFL films and his influence on us all the time. So it's crazy that it's been 10 years since he's been gone. But his his legacy will last on forever and NFL films legacy will last on forever. So thank you so much for coming on and for two fans like us kind of making our days by talking about yeah. Steve Sable. Well, I appreciate it, fellas. This was a blast. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, you know, it's a, it's definitely a fun, inspiring uh, topic to, to think about and to talk about and to share stories on. So I appreciate it. And uh, you had a podcast. That's where I first heard you, like the NFL Films podcast back a few years ago. Um, I know it's been a while since you guys have done it, but that's for people like to – 
follow that as well. Like find the, yeah. those old NFL films podcast episodes because it was really cool hearing you guys talk about the different, you know, football lives or the timelines that were happening. Like it was really awesome. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, any, anytime we can get together and just talk about what we do, like, I think that's such an important part of the process. And, um, you know, sometimes whether it's in a public forum like this, like, or our own podcast, or just, again, just working on a project, I think that, that getting people in a room, that's when one little idea bounces off another idea and it becomes something bigger that you never, and then you look back and go, where do we come up with that? You don't really know. Cause it's just people blurting stuff out and, and it just snowballs from, from one little thing into something bigger. But, um, you know, that's a, that's a magical part of this place that, that Steve helped create and, and Ed and everybody that they brought in. And, uh, you know, we're just, we're lucky to be here and, and hopefully continue it and uphold what they, what they started. So. Absolutely. So for our amazing special guest, Mr. Paul Camerata, <laughs> for the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Jose Ruiz, I'm Deremy Dove. Thank you guys for listening to Bigger Than the Game with Deremy and Jose. Take care. Peace.